regularity of complex modern pair equations? So, uh, thanks a lot. First of all, I have to say spasiba to Professor Verbitsky for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure to be in, in Moscow. Uh, next, the, the setup of my uh, talks uh, is uh, uh, I will work on omega, where omega is a domain in Cn, where usually n is greater or equal than 2. And a functions u living in omega. I will consider plurisubharmonic function in omega, which means that IDD bar of u is non negative as a current, or if you want a definition for smooth functions, that simply means for a C2 function that the complex Hessian is non negative uh, as a matrix pointwise. So I have to warn you that a lot of uh, my talk is uh, well known to experts, uh, but of course the talk, uh, the talk is aimed at non-specialists. So once again, uh, I apologize the experts for, for that. Uh, next, uh, maybe I have to answer a question that appears naturally. So if you are a geometer dealing with compact complex manifolds, why should you care about the, the local theory? So uh, there is a naive answer and uh, perhaps a non so naive one. So the naive answer is this. So if you work on a compact manifold and there you'll seek for global solutions to the Mont-Jean-Pierre equation that we learned just uh, an hour ago, then locally, since omega can be written as uh, uh, IDD bar of a potential, then rho plus phi locally solves the mont jamper equation that the complex Hessian of rho plus phi, or let me name it u if you prefer, dzj dzk bar, well, is equal to the preassigned function, or maybe not exactly f because of the volume form, but some f tilde, which is non-negative. And I will impose more assumption on the right-hand side uh, later. Of course, so, so locally, your, your global equation to solve is equ exactly fitting into the local realm. But there is a deeper reason, which I would like to emphasize now. Uh, well, if you treat the global mont jamper equation with global methods, which you shall uh, hopefully hear about uh, during the next days of the conference, then there are a lot of uh, good things that you have just from this compact situation. First of all, there is no boundary issue whatsoever to, to worry about. And there are a lot of compactness things that, that help us, that are, are on our side. But there are some drawbacks. So the, the, the greatest drawback of a global method, if you want to work globally, is that any estimates, say, if you, if you work with a priori estimates, have to take into, the, uh, into account the worst scenario possible, right? Because it's a global method. So it cannot distinguish between uh, the local situation where we prefer to have something better and uh, the situation where the worst case occurs. So let me, let me draw one example illustrating that. So suppose we are working on a compact complex manifold and there is some divisor where bad things happen and you want to solve a Monge Ampere equation with a singular right hand side. So to be more specific, uh, the situation, the setup is as this. So x omega is a compact Keller manifold just as before. So you want to solve the equation with right hand side uh, given in the following way. So there will be a function g. So g is strictly positive smooth. Uh, so g is smooth. So that's not the problematic part. But 
Additionally, let's assume that there is a line, holomorphic line bundle over X. Oh, the arrow is not exactly the way I wish, <laughs> but there is no place for that. And suppose there are two holomorphic sections of, L, of, of the line bundle L, so say sigma and tau. And then I multiply G by the norm of sigma with respect to the metric on L, raised to some power, non-negative power A, and divide by the norm of tau raised to some, some other non-negative power B. A, B are non-negative. So uh, at the zeros of the sections, which are uh, illustrated on the picture as, as this divisor, of course this is singular, and of course the singularity depends on the exponents here, and of course on the intersection of, of the zeros of sigma and tau. But, so if moreover this right-hand side is normalized so that the, the total integral is, uh, is matching the, the integral on the right-hand side, then general uh, pluripotential theory tells you that there is a solution for this equation even though the right-hand side is not smooth. The question is, what can we say about the uh, solution itself? So since the singularities are exactly here, so the natural guess would be, well, of course, it cannot be a metric throughout the singularities. So the solution has to be singular in some way. But, you but the natural expectation is that you are smooth, say, away from the singularities. And ideally, you have to have some control how this uh, metric on x minus uh, the zero set. So how this metric degenerates when, when, when we are closing up to the, to the singularity set. Let me say also that this is not an artificial setting. So if you look in the original Yao's paper, he already considered right-hand sides of this sort. And the partial explanation for that is this one. So as we know right now, the Ricci curvature of a metric is essentially you take the logarithm of the, of the volume, of the determinant, and then you take dd bar. So if you take the logarithm of f, that roughly means that you have to deal with the logarithms of the norm of the section. Uh, so minus b, the logarithm of norm of a tau, which, uh, of course, when we take dd bar, this is not a smooth function. But there will be some currents of integration associated to the divisors. So in a sense, this equation, uh, this kind of right-hand sides pop up naturally when you, will you look for, for metrics with, with uh, a rich curvature uh, supported or concentrated on a divisor. And this itself is very natural in this conical setting stuff, which was in, important in this solution of the uh, Tianyao Donaldson conjecture. So this is a natural setting, but now uh, let us uh, go back to the a priori estimate business. So how can one prove, for example, that uh, the solution is smooth of this singular set? Well, of course, if you uh, try to apply the, the say, the, the, the C2 estimates that uh, uh, you are promised to hear about uh, next day, you have no chance because the global method cannot work. The, the metric is not well defined globally. I'm not saying that uh, global methods are impossible to, to work with in such a setting, but uh, there are some, some subtle techniques, but they work only under extra conditions. So maybe as a side remark, I will put uh, the following question. Just to show you that, uh, well, there is a lot to work on in this business. So assume the right-hand side is uh, quite, simi uh, quite similar to, to what we described here. So f is integrable with respect to the volume form. n is smooth on the manifold except on some analytic subset, which uh, you can take to be uh, 
sub-variety or a point even, then if f matches the integrability condition, general theory tells you that solution phi, the unique solution phi, up to, up to an additive constant, exists. And the question is, is phi smooth on the non-singular locus? Or in other words, do we get a, a true, honest metric outside of the singular locus? So as stated, without further assumptions on the right-hand side, this is open. So for this reason, uh, working locally in a chart, say away of the singular set, might be one way how to, how to attack problems of, of, of this sort. But before I uh, move to the local theory, for pedagogical reasons, let me briefly explain what happens with the corresponding Dirichlet problem. Because the Dirichlet problem is the equation coupled with boundary data. In this setting, we don't have any boundary <coughs> data to deal with, so it's a different story. But let us first deal with the, with the Dirichlet problem. <coughs> so once again, we are in a domain in Omega. We seek for a plurisubharmonic function in Omega, which is moreover continuous up to the boundary of Omega which solves the Mont-Jampar equation with a prescribed right-hand side. And additionally, U matches at the boundary a prescribed boundary data. So uh, dependent on your background in PDE, uh, most of you, I guess, have heard uh, something about the, Poisson, the Dirichlet problem for the Poisson equation which roughly says that if the boundary of the domain has minimal regularity, by minimal I mean, for example, every C1 smooth domain is regular for the Dirichlet problem, then the Poisson equation is solvable. Uh, here, I would like to emphasize that the Dirichlet problem for the mont jean equation is a little bit different. It's a little bit trickier. So let me explain what I have in mind. So. Assume, let me draw a picture, which is not an ideal picture, but I cannot uh, draw in, in C4, say. So suppose that our domain omega contains a piece of a complex line in the boundary. So let this denote a, a complex line in the boundary. Of course, there, there is a di dimensional problem in this picture, but let's assume this is, this is like this. And assume that we have a plurisubharmonic function that is living in omega, which is more, moreover continuous up to the boundary. So now, let me take, take Li to be pieces of complex lines in omega converging to L. So let me draw the picture. So these are Li's uh, converging to L. Then. U is a plurisubharmonic function, and by very definition, that means that U restricted to Li is a subharmonic function, right? Therefore, because of the continuity up to the boundary, so let me informally write it in this way, that would mean that the boundary data, so this is phi restricted to L, when restricted to this complex line has to be subharmonic. So in particular, that means that uh, this problem is not well posed for every boundary data. There is a restriction, so you cannot uh, arbitrarily set the, the boundary data and expect a solution that is continuous up to the boundary. So there, so does the, the theory for the Dirichlet problem splits into two pieces. So either you restrict the possible boundary data which is one option, or, which is the case I will follow, you put geometric assumptions on the boundary of, of domain. For example, such uh, conditions that exclude having complex lines in the boundary. So now, let me mention the, 
the fundamental result in, in this business that is, so to speak, the, the local analog of the Calabi-Yau theorem, which is, was surprisingly proven later than Calabi-Yau theorem and is due to uh, four mathematicians. This is Caffarelli, Cohn, Nuremberg, and Sprack. The theorem is well known as CKNS theorem. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. Well, Trudinger, I think Trudinger would always. Uh, yeah, yeah, but not in Moscow. Uh -huh. Because that much Moscow is probably much more famous. Than oh, oh, I see. Ah, okay. But I think he was in Moscow then. He was in Moscow then and immigrated. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the was not as, uh, <laughs> so assume that the boundary of omega is smooth. So in fact, this uh, this can be weakened. So so weaker assumptions that then smoothness is needed. Uh, it's enough to assume that the boundary is in C k alpha for for large k in alpha. But I will not get into details. But moreover, assume that uh, omega is strictly pseudo-convex. So for those of you who don't know pseudo about pseudo-convexity, you can uh, simply assume that uh, omega is strictly convex, or simply say a ball, if you prefer, in, in CN. So that's the geometric assumption needed to rule out such, such bad, bad behavior. Then assume that phi is any smooth boundary data. And moreover, assume that f is strictly positive, and f is also smooth up to the boundary. Then the outcome is that there is a unique solution, u, solving the Dirichlet problem. And moreover, u is smooth up to the boundary. So kind of a local version of of uh, Calabi-Yau theorem. So for a moment, uh, I leave this uh, world of Dirichlet problems and focus on local regularity. And I will return to that in a couple of minutes. How that, that for the Taylor didn't have it? Uh, uh, oh, they had, have only weak solution. In fact, this theorem easily implies that for Taylor, there is much. OK, so now let's move to local regularity. So uh, uh, we keep in mind that setting that we have uh, a, a compact manifold, and we work in a local chart where, where the right-hand side, side data is smooth. And we expect smooth solutions for that. But the, the big problem in the theory, which might be striking, is that no matter how regular the right-hand side is, you can never be sure that the solution will be smooth there. So there is a, a classical counterexample due to Pagarelov. I hope I pronounce it not that wrong. Uh, which is uh, for the real mont jamper equation, but uh, uh, Bolsky observed that everything can be transplanted into the complex setting. It is an explicit example, so let me write it down. So uh, let's divide the coordinate in Cn as the first coordinate and the rest. Let me write it in this way. And construct the look at the following function. So u of z will be simply 1 plus norm of z1 squared multiplied by the norm of the remaining variables raised to the power 2 times 1 minus 1 over m. 
So by explicit computation that I will not perform here, you can compute that the Mont Jamper of the function u is some numerical constant, so 1 minus 1 over n to the power n, times 1 plus z1 squared raised to the power n minus 2. Of course, some care has to be uh, done because this function is singular at uh, z prime equal to 0. But this equality holds true in, in any reasonable sense. So in a, it, this is a weak solution, a, a pluripotential solution, also a viscosity solution. So everything is in our favor here. Of course, the right-hand side is strictly positive, smooth, error analytic, if you please. But the solution is singular. So uh, let me also say that this example does not violate Farrelly, Kohn, Nirenberg, Sprague theorem because the singularities are global. So the picture is like that. So you cannot have a smooth data such that uh, inside uh, such a solution lives. And there is one interesting uh, difference with the real theory in the sense that the Pogorelov original example, the real for the real case, only works in dimension three. Or three and up, yes. It, it doesn't work in dimension two. In fact, such a local regularity counter example in dimension two, in the real case, does not hold the theorem of Alexandro. But in the complex in, case, it already works in dimension in two. In, in, yes, indeed. In CN, starting from dimension 2 and higher, of course, for dimension 1, it's the, Lapla the, the Poisson equation. Then, then we get a local smoothness. But this is trivial then. So what can one do in such a setting? Uh, well, there is no uh, boundary data to, uh, to work with. So we have to add some assumptions on the solution u itself. So the, the, the main question will be, so u solves the equation f locally in a, in a ball, if you like. What should be added to the assumptions on u such that, it, uh, that we get the, the, the implication that f is strictly positive? F is smooth. So under what additional assumptions U is smooth? Well, this example clearly shows that something has to be added. But on the bright side, uh, what we heard uh, during the, the, the Bignev Bodsky's lecture shows us that if u has some much better regularity, for example, if we assume that u belongs to the space C2 alpha, for, which means, of course, that u is C2 differentiable and the second uh, partial derivatives are alpha, here all they're continuous in the domain where everything works for some alpha greater than 0. And f is strictly positive and smooth, then the implication is that u is smooth. So maybe a quick explanation why, why this holds. Well, let's, let's cheat a little bit and differentiate the equation. So differentiating the, the, the derivative, we are going to end up with, uh, these are the cofactors of the matri matrix. And then we have, if we differentiate in some fixed direction, E, say, then we are going to end up with UE ij bar. And this is equal to Fe, so to speak. But under the assumption that U belongs to C2 alpha, well, the cofactors, well, these are products of the coefficients of the, of the complex Hessian matrix. They are. I'm sorry, yeah, it's a logarithm. Uh, if this is, yeah, if you're differentiating the, the, the logarithm. Yeah. I agree. Uh, so the, but the issue is on the, on the left hand side. So if u belongs to C to alpha, then 
Every term uij belongs to C alpha. It is alpha Holder continuous. So product of such terms is also alpha Holder continuous. So we end up with coefficients here being alpha Holder continuous functions. So this is an elliptic equation for the derivative of u, which, has, uh, which is strictly elliptic. That's because u is in C2. Therefore, the C2 norm of u is under control with alpha conti Holder continuous coefficients. Therefore, Schauder theory applies. So that's exactly the, uh, the setup for Schauder theory. And that's, that roughly says that, that a solution gains two derivatives. So in particular, is if the right-hand side is smooth, which, which is by assumption, then the solution will be, will be smooth. Uh, using this evans krylov theory that was also mentioned, you can reduce this assumption, u being to C to alpha, to uh, Laplacian of u being bounded. So that's enough under this assumption to assume that u is smooth. Observe that this is not satisfied in this case. So the question is, what happens in the gap between the assumption that the Laplacian is bounded and this, this counterexample? Uh, and the answer depends on what kind of regularity scale do you, uh, do you work with. Uh, there are two standard scales of regularity used in PDE. You can work with uh, Sobolev scale. Or with, uh, let me say it, Holder scale. So what happens in the first case? So you can explicitly compute where does this uh, function belongs. So by explicit computation, this example belongs to W2P space for every P that is less than N times N minus 1, where N is the complex dimension we work in. So the question is, uh, if we assume a solution uh, to the Mon Jean Perry equation with strictly positive and smooth right hand side. And additionally, we assume that u belongs to a Sobolev space WP for some p higher than this threshold. Does this imply that u is smooth? And uh, an answer to this question is positive. That's a theorem uh, by Gwotsky and me. that yes. So in, in particular, this says that this is the worst example on the, whole, on, the, on the Sobolev scale. So everything that is slightly regular than this one has to be already smooth. So this is the, in a sense, the extremal example. And this, the second case is, of course, when we work in the Holder scale. Second derivatives are in LP. Yes, that means that, uh, of course, the first derivatives are in LP, second are in LP, and the function of itself is, is also in LP. The second scale, which is. Uh, different thing may, may happen. So, uh, the. Uh, under some additional uh, uh, addi uh, assumptions, for example, that it belongs to a slightly regular space than n times n minus 1, some sort of orly space, the answer is yes, that the general case remains open. But it is kind of a borderline uh, case. Now, if you work in the Holder scale, then this example clearly belongs to the space of functions that are once differentiable. And the first derivative belongs to the space 1 minus 2 over n. Right? So, so the, the, the question is whether if u belongs to C1 gamma for gamma larger, what happens then? 
And quite surprisingly, uh, we still don't know the answer to this problem. So this is open. So without getting into the details, let me briefly explain why the, the, the Sobolev scale is better than the Holder scale in this business. Well, that, that's what we get then, because we multiply by, by z prime. Then it should be C1, right? No, that, 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 that's the assumption. So in, in the case n is equal to 2, this is the simply norm of z prime. Okay. okay. Now, if. Uh, if we work in the Sobolev scale, we have two weak derivatives to work with. Okay. So then the cofactor matrix, which I mentioned, uij, well, you cannot make sense of that pointwise, but of course, you, that makes sense in some, not in LP sense, but LP over n minus 1 sense. At, at least we have some condition on the on the cofactor matrix, and therefore this operator taking the uh, function maybe h and sending it to uh, to such a such a quantity at least makes sense in certain LP spaces under good assumption. To the contrary, when we work with C1 gamma functions, then there is no hope to take two classical derivatives or two weak derivatives of such a function. And therefore, this cofactor matrix doesn't make sense at all. Uh, now, why do we hope, nevertheless, to, to prove such a result? Because it is true for the real analog of the, of the, of the theory. Namely, if we work with the real Monjang per equation rather than with the complex Monjang per equation, then an analogous statement, as I said, there are examples uh, like this in the real theory, starting from dimension 3. But then the analogous result is true, as well as the uh, Sobolev scale regularity. And all this is due to results of uh, Urbas and Caffarelli. So. I will emphasize the role of Caffarelli. So, in so for real Monjamper equation, uh, analogous statements are true. So, I still have some time. So, maybe it's a so in the real case, we deal in Rn. And there, uh, uh, the, we deal with, with real Monjan per equation. If I remember correctly, uh, the example looks exactly like this one. So it's once, uh, so, so, so it is n rather than 2n. If I remember. So. Uh, One over the real dimension. Now, what is the the main difference between the real Monjamper theory and the complex Monjamper theory? For the real Monjamper theory, we deal you deal with convex functions, and convex function is a very nice tool. There are uh, a lot of things available to to work with. For example, you get for free that a convex function is a local Lipschitz function. Here, you, you have no regularity at all. Second thing is that sublevel sets of convex functions, so if V is convex, then the sublevel of such a function is a convex set. And this is really helpful in this, this, this whole theory, uh, machinery uh, invest, uh, invented by Caffarelli. In the polaris subharmonic case, the sublevel set of a polaris subharmonic function is not even connected in general. So it's way, way different story. 
So uh, the the pieces of every 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 component is pseudo convex. Okay, and uh, last but not least, as I said, the uh, the real e example of, of Pagarelov exists, but additionally, in the real case, there is so-called interior estimates for the Mon Jamper equation, and they consist of the following. If we consider the Dirichlet problem that the real Hessian of V is prescribed, V is convex, and V restricted to the boundary of the domain is zero, observe that this is slightly different than the setting of Caffarelli, Kohn, Nuremberg, and Sprague theorem. We prescribe boundaries data to be zero, but we don't assume smoothness of the boundary itself. So the, the convex set might, might be singular, it might have cusps whatsoever. Then the solution has C2 interior estimate. That means that the C2 norm in any compact subdomain, so that's U, in any compact subdomain, you can bound the C2 norm of the solution by the, um, by the data available. And then uh, you can bound this. So such interior estimates in the complex setting uh, uh, are unknown in that generality. And uh, let me show you. So. I don't know what is the opinion of the majority of the experts. Some say that these are impossible to be proven in, in general in the complex setting, some hope for them. But let me show how, how this could be applied. To our initial problem. So say we work in a chart where we have the solution to the Mon Jamper equation. Right? And suppose that at a point, so let's pick a point in the in the chart, let me name it by Z. So phi of Z, or rather the graph of phi, can be touched from below by some local pluriharmonic mapping. So we have a pluriharmonic V, so dd bar of V is equal to zero, so phi is greater or equal than V in a neighborhood of Z with equality at this point. So this is an assumption, of course it is trivial when phi is C2 smooth, then you do the Taylor expansion, take the pluriharmonic part of order up to two, and that will play the role of the function v. But in general, that this is this is this is the, the assumption one has to make. Then we take the potential for the metric omega, i d d bar of rho, but not an arbitrary one. We take a potential such that rho has a minimum at z. So this is possible, to choose such a potential which has a minimum exactly at the point z. So that would mean that the function rho plus phi minus v, that's a local function, of course, but it locally solves the same motion per equation. So this, this function has a bump at the point z. Its graph looks roughly speaking as, 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 a, as a parabola upstairs. The reason being that, uh, well, phi minus v already has a minimum, and we can assume that rho has a strict minimum at the point z, and for this reason the, the graph looks roughly speaking that way. So therefore, if we are looking at the sublevel sets for that, we cut the graph of the function at some level. This will be <laughs> some compact sets, which uh, co compact uh, sets which might, might be multiply connected, but for c suffi sufficiently close to the infimum of that function, uh, it, it will be one domain. 
containing z and at this domain the function is constant at the boundary so we consider then the Dirichlet problem over this domain with prescribed right hand side which is smooth and strictly positive and constant boundary data and now if we had some interior estimate like in the in the real case then that would lead to an estimate for the <coughs> complex hessian of the function rho plus phi minus v but in fact that means an estimate for phi at z so unfortunately as i said before these interior estimates are missing and therefore <coughs> this kind of works only heuristically so there is a, a lot of work to be done to make this picture work work globally so i think that's everything i wanted to say thank you very precious Yes. And you prescribe such a boundary condition. Yes. Uh, is there any interior library? A special case, just on the one that is a constant. Because it serves like a harmonic function for the linear, for the linear condition. Well, uh, if you take, uh, well, if you take constant boundary data, the question is open. If you take any boundary data, then this case, in, uh, this example with dimension n equal to 2 has constant right hand side. And it's, yes. And you can make that in any dimension to work. So constant right hand side, but without assuming something on the boundary data doesn't work. Even constant uh, do not yield uh, smooth solutions. So you have to assume something on the, on the boundary data. something like complex analog of C1 estimates of Caffarelli, if I understood correctly. For C1, est uh, the, there is an interior analog if uh, the domain itself is convex. Okay. But in a general pseudo-convex domain, this is open. So under, if the domain is convex itself, then interior C1 estimate holds. But uh, uh, In the real case? In, uh, as in the real case, in the, in the complex uh, case, you have the same theorem. Um, I'm just asking because I, I don't know. So, so this, 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 there are there are theorems of Caffarelli about C1, which is more or less. Well, that's, it's not that hard, and C2, which are very very difficult. So so, so it's more like the the, the first part. In the, in the yes, but uh, well, the, ha having a uh, an interior estimate for for C1 yes. in a general pseudo convex domain is open. That's all. Uh -huh. In a general, uh, if you assume convex domain, okay. then 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 it's true. But but for pseudo convex, it's all. But, but it's pro non convex probably not true. Uh, well, I don't know what to believe in right now. For there are some arguments against that, and and good reasons to, to, to for that. Again, to be. you are talking about.